Hello everyone, my name is Juliette Campassi. I'm the Events and Research Coordinator at the Institute of Leadership and Management. I would like to welcome you to today's webinar. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You have joined the presentation listening using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the telephone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dialing information will be displayed. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to Carl today by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. It's my great pleasure to introduce Kate Cooper, Head of Research, Policy and Standards at the Institute of Leadership and Management. Kate, over to you. Thanks very much, Juliet, and a very warm welcome to Carol and everyone who's joining us today. Carol's the CEO of the Full Potential Group. She's a coach, speaker on TV and radio, frequent contributor to all sorts of publications, and is particularly passionate at the moment about the role that neuroscience plays. And I can speak from first-hand experience here because Carol spoke at a recent conference that we ran and I attended, and she certainly did get everybody up on their feet, joining in and being inspired. So thank you, Carol, over to you. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Kate. And hello to everybody. Thank you for making the time on this beautiful sunny day. Um, and equally, I think it's quite a poignant day today because it is World Mental Health Day. And so I feel a little bit of a shiver going down my spine when I'm here to talk about fulfilling more of your potential by boosting your brain power, um, because this is a really key topic for me. Um, I've worked for over 20 years with leaders, helping them realize more of their potential. I'm always looking for what's new or what's going to make the real difference for people. And um, neuroscience has been in the news a lot over the last few years. And I've been looking for something that is really practical and pragmatic that will really genuinely help leaders understand some of this latest information that we have on our brains. And also for me personally, it's of particular importance. Um, about just over five years ago, I had quite uh, severe breast cancer. And when you go through chemotherapy and things like that, you obviously lose quite a lot of your brain cells. So I did struggle for a while. And part of my mission on getting better and fulfilling my own potential, because that's what I'm trying to do as a, uh, as a person in my life, as well as helping other people, was how can I boost my brain? How do I get my brain cells back? And so I have been on a journey over the last five years to really understand that. And that's why I'm particularly keen to be talking about this today. So how do we boost our, our um, own potential with our brain power? Well, what I'm going to talk about really is um, why agile brain power is critical um, to fulfilling more of your potential. And it's not just brain power, it's your agility um, and how you flex with all the different parts of your brain. Um, because when your brain becomes more agile, we can really boost learning your performance and competitive advantage for your businesses. And also what I want to do, and I know we haven't got long, is help you understand how you can make your brain work faster and more effectively. And by learning it for yourself, you can help other people too. And I'm going to touch very, very briefly on six drivers to help you improve your brain power, which will support you in your learning, your own performance, but very importantly, your well-being. So that's my sort of structure for the day. And I think lots of businesses these days are talking about businesses need to be more agile. And it's a really hot topic that keeps CEOs and leaders awake at night. And I think if a business is going to be agile, the people need to be agile. And we can start with our brains. Now, brain power is important. And I think one of the key mantras in this new business age is, you know, we need everyone needs to do a lot of things. But if we can do them simpler, better and faster, then we can add more value in the companies uh, that we work for and to the people that we serve. And I think it's quite scary that we process 30 times more information than 20 years ago. So our brains have to work 30 times harder, and I suspect this figure is going higher. So there's so much information that we do need to work through. And if we can make our brains work better and make the whole process simpler, then we'll be more productive. And also 80 to 90 percent of serious injuries and accidents are attributed to human error. When we understand how our brain is wired, we can actually get a feeling for where we're likely to have errors or where we might make mistakes. I'm going to touch on that briefly, too, because there are health and safety aspects as well as mental health um, to support people with the head and the heart. 
And also because we have to work faster and achieve more um, and with AI coming in, I think it's important for leaders to, for us to be even more human. We need to work faster. We need to work with machines and AI and not compete against it. But 60 to 70 percent of current jobs are going to be redundant in the next 10 years. So the more agile our brains and the more we can adapt and change um, to circumstances, the better. So I think we all have a brain. So why not improve it as much as we can, whatever job we're doing? And the uh, World Economic Forum did a skills projection of what are the leadership skills that are going to be most needed by 2020. And this slide shows the top 10 skills. And you can see th the first three out of the top 10 are all brain power skills. So increasingly, we need to be good at complex problem solving, critical thinking and creativity. And all of those need our brain firing as well as it possibly can. You'll also notice number seven is judgment and decision making. And number 10 is cognitive flexibility. So I'm going to be talking about flexibility and agility and how you can use that to really help these things so that we can be more human and make more of an impact as leaders. So I've been doing quite a bit of talking and um, our brains are incredibly powerful. I mean, there's unlimited potential in our brains. So when I went through chemotherapy, the good news for me was actually I've already got plenty of brain cells, even though I'd lost some. But we've got um, a uh, poll coming up and I'd be curious as to how many brain cells do you think we have? You know, we all have a lot, um, but on average, how many brain cells or neurons, as we call them, do you think an average person has? And I know Juliet is going to be monitoring the poll for me. So I'd be quite curious to uh, get a sense of what you feel and how powerful you feel your brain is. Are we starting to get some uh, answers in, Juliet? Yes, we are. We're nearly there. OK, we have the answers and I'm going to share them on the screen for the audience to see. So 5% said 1 million, 5% said 1 billion, 33% said 10 billion, 29% said 100 billion and 29% 1 trillion. Whoa. So the question is, who is right? Well, quite a number of people on this webinar are right. Um, so the ones that are right are the ones that answered, we typically have a trillion brain cells. So that's a thousand billion in total. So it's a huge amount of brain cells, and that includes 100 billion that are active nerve cells, and then 900 billion others that glue and nourish and insulate the cells. So 100 billion active nerve cells, but a trillion brain cells. That's a huge amount. So there is such an unlimited potential in how we can use our brains. And this is quite interesting. Those 100 billion active nerve cells, each one of those, so one neuron, one active nerve cell can make 100,000 connections and processes 1,000 impulses a second at the speed of sound. So it's a huge amount, you know, 2.5 to 3.5 billion connections going on in our brain at any one time. So we have an incredible opportunity to use that potential. And the idea is how do we keep that flowing and how do we use that flexibility? And um, neuroagility is a phrase that was coined by a neuroscientist in South Africa that we've been doing a lot of work with. And you'll see a picture of him in the slide coming up, but his name is Dr. Andre Vermoulin. And he actually coined this frame, phrase neuroagility. And what he means by it is neuroagility is about the readiness of all senses of our brain to function as one integrated whole brain system. So rather than having lots of different parts of our brain, it's actually how they integrate together and how we use them together to become more agile. Because once they're integrated and fully integrated, they're a lot more responsive to receive and transmit biochemical impulses at optimum capacity. And very importantly, especially if we're in new situations or potentially stressful situations. So as the world speeds up and we all get busier, and equally, if people get tired, then our brains won't work at maximum capacity. So the more integrated all the parts of your brain are, and the more neuroagile you are, you have the flexibility to learn new skills quickly. So those new jobs that are around the corner, we've got the flexibility and adaptability to learn those quickly. And it will also help us 
fast track and change our attitudes and behavior fast and easily. And very importantly, because I know I've done a lot of neuroscience to help people in coaching on how they um, unlearn old behavior patterns or how they change the patterns in their brain. Well, actually, the more neuroagile you are, the quicker you are and the more able you are to unlearn old neural patterns and to then repattern your brain to create new ones. So that's the sort of technical um, explanation of what neuroagility is. But I think at this point it's actually quite useful to be able to see a bit of what it is. So I'm just going to show you a very um, short video clip. I'm going to cut it part way through. But to give you a bit of a sense of these people are very highly I'm sorry to cut that off at its prime, um, but when we're really neuroagile, we have that flexibility to speak or sing, to move, to do cross lateral exercises. So move across our bodies um, and do quite highly coordinated activities all at once. Um, so just so that you can get a sense of that, um, it's thinking about how many times do you have to be um, very actively involved in lots of things. So, you know, at the moment I'm speaking, I'm looking at my slides, I'm thinking, what am I going to say next? And there's lots of things going on. And the more neuroagile we are, the more we're actually able to use all these different capacities at the same time. So Andre, oops, I've gone too quickly. Um, this is a picture of Andre. And he said that you can actually measure someone's neuroagility. So what he's created is an online assessment and similar to a personality profile. But rather than when you answer questions saying, is this more like you or less like you? He actually gets you to do exercises because he's actually working out how your brain's wired. So the, the assessment might say, put one hand over this eye, turn here put your hand here and what do you see? Do you see a line, a square, or a triangle? And he's working out whether you lead with your left or your right brain, which parts of your brain you're activating and whether you lead with your left or your right eye or your left or your right ear and even your left or your right hand. So he's actually got a methodology to look at, first of all, how your brain's wired um, and each of us has a unique neurological design. So we look at seven different factors of how your brain's wired, which it explains in your profile. But then once you understand how your brain's wired, he's also looked at how he can measure six different drivers, which can really help you boost your brain power and be more effective as a leader and be better at what you do day to day in your life. So when we look at the seven factors and how our brain's designed, I don't have time on this webinar to go through all of them, but probably the most common one that you'll be familiar with already, I suspect, is lateral dominance. And what we mean by lateral dominance is, do you lead with your left hemisphere or your right hemisphere? So we all use both. And the more neuroagile you are, the more you flex very quickly between your left and right all the time. But each one of us has one side that is dominant, one side that leads. So we're gonna put another poll up in a minute, but just as I explain this, um, so if you feel that you are left brain dominant or left hemisphere dominant, you're likely to be more logical, detailed, you know, you're like process, planning, structure, um, you like a methodical way to think things through and you will tend to think inside the box in quite a systematic theoretical way. And some of you on this session are likely to lead with your left brain. There'll be other people who will lead with their right hemisphere. So if you're right hemisphere dominant, we call it the holistic side of the brain. So you will tend to you know, think about things in a more creative, holistic way. You'll pick up emotions. That's part of what your brain will tune into. You'll be more impulsive and spontaneous and thinking outside the box rather than in the box. You know, learning through pictures and really stimulating in a practical way your brain. So you multitask. 
So if we can just load the second poll, I'm just really curious on this webinar as to what percentage of people feel that they lead with the left side of the brain or they lead with the right? Because we all do, whether we like it or not, have one side that's slightly more dominant. If you actually do the assessment, you actually get a percentage on a dial of to what degree your left or right hemisphere dominant. And it's always quite fascinating for me in workshops when uh, people see where they are. So I don't know how we're getting on with the poll, Julia. Is it, are the figures coming in? Yeah, um, yeah, the answers are coming in. Um, and I think we now have the results. So 45% uh, of the audience said that yeah. they, are, they, they use their left hemisphere, 36% use the right hemisphere, and 18% uh, said that they're not sure. Okay, thank you. And what we look at from a, a neurological point of view, from brain agility, is we look at whether people are what we call homolateral or bilateral. So if you're homolateral, what that means is you predominantly use one side of your brain. So the 45% of you that felt that you were potentially more left brain, it's to what degree do you use that and sort of get stuck in that gear, if you like, rather than flex quickly and a more bilateral and move from left to right. So it's quite interesting to understand that about yourself. But when we're also looking, there are seven different assets that we look at in terms of how your brain's designed. So we look at the lateral dominance, and this just gives you an example of this a particular person where they were so slightly more right brain, like 36% of you. But we don't just look at that activity. We look at when you're stimulated, when your brain is working, do you first of all stimulate the brain cells at the front of your brain or at the back of your brain? Now, if you stimulate the front of your brain first, you tend to be more expressive. So you will tend to learn by talking about things, expressing things, and you need to get it out to be able to perform well. Whereas if you're more receptive and you tend to fire at the neural pathways at the back of your brain, then you will want to absorb information, gather it together and allow your brain cells to sort of ruminate on it before you um, come up with a response. So it's quite useful. What we look at is do you lead with the left brain or the right brain? Are you expressive or are you receptive? And um, that puts your brain into four quadrants. So we look at those four quadrants and what are the implications for you? We also look at, are you rational or emotional? So again, when you're stimulated, does the outside, the cerebral cortex get stimulated first? Or does the underneath of your brain, so um, the limbic system, the emotional center get stimulated first? So some people find that you know, they stimulate the limbic system and they are more emotional. So those 45% of people that felt they were logical, you may well, for example, lead with the left brain and you may well be quite reflective and want to think about things, but you might want to reflect using an emotional part of your brain. So your reflection could be quite emotive. Whereas someone else might lead on the right side of the brain and be more holistic in the way they approach things, and they may be expressive, so they might want to verbalize and talk things through a lot, but they may well um, stimulate the cerebral cortex. So they could be quite rational in the things that they want to talk about. So it's interesting looking at people on those three di dimensions to start with. So it's a bit like a 3D person. But then what gets absolutely fascinating is we also look at your brain and sensory dominance. Now, this is something that you become aware of because most of us are predominantly either right handed or left handed. So we look at do you lead with the right hand or the left hand and how does that impact your brain? Because it changes your brain's wiring. But also, and I didn't realize this until I started studying it, we look at do you lead with the left eye or the right eye? One will be slightly more dominant than the other. And we look at what's the implications for that with your brain. Also, some people lead with the left ear and some people lead with the right ear. So we look at that. So we start to look at the whole configurations and then if you might be stressed or tired, what could the implications be? Because sometimes that's where people can make mistakes. So whether people are manual workers or working machinery, or even if they're a dealer in the city, having to make very quick decisions or an accountant, sometimes we might be compromised under stress by our brain. So we look at that. 
We also look at to what degree are people visual, auditory or kinesthetic. Now, I'm sure some of you on this session will be familiar with that because it does have a huge impact on the way we learn and how productive we are. When we do the profile, you actually come out with a percentage against visual, auditory and kinesthetic. And quite a lot of people have a high degree of visual. And these days, you know, the world is pretty visual. So watching videos, um, learning through pictures, um, not having slides with too many words on, that sort of thing can really stimulate people. Um, but also some people are very auditory. And sometimes the best um, way to stimulate someone with high auditory is to use Baroque music. So having music playing, I had someone in a workshop last week who said she's so sensitive, she's very auditory, so sensitive to sound, she actually works in an open plan office and has to wear headphones. So understanding how you can perform better by understanding whether you lead by being uh, visual, auditory or kinesthetic. Now, I was quite surprised when I got my results because I was quite strongly kinesthetic. I use visual and I have a little bit of auditory, but primarily I'm kinesthetic. Now, kinesthetic means you like to touch things and feel things, but you need to move. And since understanding my profile, I realise that I learn best and I'm more productive if I'm walking around. Now, obviously, I can't do a webinar and walk around because it would probably drive you mad. Um, but if I sit for too long um, or if I'm meetings for too long, my productivity will drop quite significantly. So even having stand up meetings, making sure that um, I get up regularly. So it used to be annoying having to get up and go to the photocopier, whereas now I think I'm kinesthetic. This is boosting my brain power for two seconds while I go and pick up the piece of paper. So it's being mindful of that. We also look at uh, different intelligence preferences and how you actually use your brain, which is also quite fascinating. So just going back to the propensity for error, because I think this is quite an interesting thing. So our left brain controls the right side of the body. So all of you, those 45% of people who felt that they were left brain dominant, your left brain will control your right side of your body. So if you're right handed, right eyed and right eared, then you'll be very well coordinated. Now, here's the rub. If we get tired or if we get stressed, our non-dominant brain hemisphere switches off. So if you're left brain dominant, your right brain will switch off under stress. So you still have access to all the logic and all that great stuff that you like, but you'll be less holistic. So it's quite interesting to be aware of that. And equally, I'm aware that some people on the session were right brain dominant. So the right brain controls the left side of the body. So it's good news if you're left handed and if you lead with the left eye and the left ear. I know this might be getting a little bit complicated, but it is actually fascinating to understand. Now, this is um, a profile that shows a little bit more about my brain. So leading with the right hemisphere, the bad news for me is that if I get stressed, my left side switches off and my left side controls the right side of my body. And I'm actually right handed. So um, I'm not wearing it at the moment, but do actually have a sling for my hand because I've hurt my right hand and my wrist. Um, and the thing is, my right hand is my expressive hand. So sometimes I'm not if I'm stressed, I don't explain myself as well. Um, and I don't articulate this clearly, whether that's verbally or written down. Um, sometimes if people are compromised on the ear, it means that they don't listen as well if they're tired or stressed. And if you're compromised in the eye, you just don't see things. So I had an accountant the other day whose profile, his eye was compromised when he was stressed. And he said, I have to get people to double check my figures because I just miss things that normally I wouldn't. So it's quite useful to understand a little bit about that. So that's a tiny bit on the seven different ways that your brain's wired that can really help you as a leader if you want to think about that a bit more. What we also look at is six drivers that can really optimise your brain's performance. I'm not going to talk about them all today because that's a bigger topic, but there are six things that we actually measure. Um, brain fitness, so how fit your brain is, how quickly you flex between your left hemisphere and your right hemisphere. Um, stress has a huge impact on the brain and releases neurotransmitters that actually inhibit and inhibitor chemicals that inhibit your brain's performance. So we look at how people manage stress. Sleep is very important. 
and it's the quality of our sleep that will affect our brain power. Um, I don't know if anyone's read this book, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, but it's got some really good tips around why sleep is so important. And I'm finding with some of the leaders that I'm working with, their brain power is not, work, is not as effective because they're not having the deep delta sleep that our brains need for recovery. Um, movement is also very important um, and for some people that's the thing that keeps their brain stimulated it increases our endorphins and lots of great chemicals that make our brain work more productively and um, this is a great book called spark and um, it's you can buy it on google it shows you how exercise will perform improve your brain performance but particularly cross lateral exercises so going across your midline um, is very good um, whether that's swimming um, yoga martial arts even playing chess but things that's stimulating both sides of the brain our attitude is also important um, and a positive attitude and Andre would argue that that's probably one of the most critical factors for high performance um, and also our food and nutrition and making sure that we're eating essential fatty acids for our brain and drinking enough water. So I just want to finish on brain fitness because I was quite shocked when I first did my profile, my brain was only 40% fit. And the norm across the people we've profiled so far is 48%. But ideally, we'd want high performing teams and high performing organizations to be at least 80% brain fit. And that's the ability to switch between left and right brain. So it's like having WD-40 on your gear so that you have you maneuver very quickly. So if you want to improve your brain fitness, I'm going to show you a really quick video which gives you a bit of an idea about brain fitness. And um, if you want to humor me, um, I certainly in the workshops, we get people doing this, but really getting a sense of um, moving. <laughs> I'll, I'll cut it out in terms of watching the whole of the, the video. Um, but doing a regular brain boogie uh, and having that opportunity to do cross lateral exercises will really keep your brain stimulated. So we can help people be more neuroagile with using the profile, but also masterclasses to understand it or webinars like this for people to understand it. And if anyone here is interested, we actually crediting people so that you can bring it into your organization. So I wonder if there's any questions Hello, yes, thanks very much, Carol. We've only, actually only got time for one question, but I think it's quite a long one. And yep. somebody's asked, why do you think we put so much weight on rational rather than emotional? And I think that's come up through, through the ages, um, through the schooling system. And I think schools are changing a lot around that now. And there's a huge amount of body of evidence. Um, but I think it's just from traditional learning that there's the assumption um, that a lot of people are rational, whereas actually we really aren't. So I think schools are now improving and you know they're talking a lot about growth mindset now and they're bringing emotional aspects in. Um, so you know this is relatively new, but that's partly why I'm on a mission to spread it to as many people. And there is a child's profile to actually help younger people, I think the sooner we learn how our brains wired and use it to fulfill our potential, the better. So just really a follow on from that. So when you're disparaged, perhaps in a meeting for not being rational, and um, what would your sort of have you a one line put down quick response to that? Um, I would say that uh, to fully potentialize my brain, uh, the way my brain's wired is um, I actually have an emotional preference and I think I can add more value to this meeting by bringing that to, to the meeting. 
That's lovely. Thank you very much. So that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid. So back to Juliet, who will give us the final instructions. Thank you once again, Carol. Really interesting. And of course, thank you to everybody who's joined us today. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Carolyn, Kate, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey in the presentation and we would appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. On behalf of the Institute of Leadership and Management and our presenter, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.